This is Meet the Candidates on Brattleboro Community Television. I'm your host, Chris Lenoir, and today we're speaking with Laura Sibilia. She's an independent state representative for the Wyndham Bennington District, which includes the towns of Dover, Wardsboro, Somerset, Searsburg, Reedsboro, and Stamford. Welcome, Laura. How are you? I'm doing good. And then that, that's all the time we have because of all the town <laughs> names that I had to mention there. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, I, I've joked about that with you before about your constituency, how you have such a large territory to cover, uh, a different number of communities with different needs uh, certainly creates a lot of challenges in terms of how you serve them in the legislature. Uh, talk a little bit about it. Do you come up with an overarching theme for what you're telling voters this time around? Yeah, no, I think so. And I think I find a fair amount of commonalities. Um, you know, these towns that I represent, they're really, they're all along the Route 100 um, corridor in the spine going down the center of southern Vermont. Uh, you know, the town that I live in is Dover, obviously. That's the resort town where our resort is. But most of the towns in the valley, all of the towns in the valley really are a part of that kind of economy. And so I find that they have a fair amount of shared interests fair amount of shared needs um, and legislative um, legislative challenges or opportunities as the case might be. So for instance, we have a number of small schools. Um, we definitely have challenges throughout the district um, with broadband and cell. Um, not as much in my town that I live in, uh, but throughout most of the rest of the town. So some challenges there. Yeah, well, and you went to the legislature Two years ago, you defeated John Moran, Democrat, who is running against you again this time around. Uh, is it, well, it's obviously different, you being the incumbent this time versus the challenger, but in terms of how you're distinguishing yourself on issues, are there any changes? No, I think, I mean, I think I have a little more experience from having been uh, in the legislature, but I think the priorities that I was running on uh, the first time, I think I did the work that I said that I was going to do. Um, focusing on issues that were really important to our district and to southern Vermont as well as to rural Vermont uh, and our overall economy. And I think that those um, issues still hold true and I'm still talking about those things. So Now, you're an independent. Yes. Do you think there's an issue there for, for voters in terms of thinking about you as their state representative? How are you telling them that you're compensating for that? Well, I think that uh, there are pluses and minuses to being an independent. Um, Yes, you are not necessarily party to all of the in-depth party conversations, um, but you also have, you know, not as much pressure on you to vote in a certain way or, or, you know, work on a certain policy. So, um, with regard to my constituents, you know, I've worked really hard. I have worked hard with uh, Democrats, with progressives, with Republicans, and my fellow independents, and. Um, even in my two years that I've been there, I think I have, um, I've earned um, the respect of a number of folks in there. And I think I've been pretty successful um, working with folks even in, within parties. You know, I've worked with the leadership of both parties on different initiatives. So I think if you work hard, if you, um, if you are an honest broker and, you know, communicative to both your constituents and the Vermonters in general, I think people want to work with you. Yeah. So. You uh, wrote on your website, laurasibiliavt.com, uh, about your opponent uh, and special interest groups lobbying for a national agenda, uh, mm -hmm. funding opposition to your campaign. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's a, a disadvantage for you in the fundraising and not having access to those monies. How are you seeing that play out in your current campaign? So uh, right now, I think we're about even in terms of fundraising. We'll see. There's another um, deadline that's coming up this Friday, and uh, we'll see what happens. Um, last time I returned a lot of money and I out fundraised um, my opponent. Um, this time I'm so busy, I've not even spent as much time fundraising um, as I did last time. I am somebody that really feels like proof's in the pudding, folks. You know, either I'm doing a good job and I'm talking to you and telling you what's going on and you want me to continue, or I'm not. But I do know that I'm working hard and um, I would like to go back. And, you know, the voters are going to let me know if that's what they would like. Is campaign finance an issue for you? Is it something you wish that the laws were a little bit different here in the state of Vermont to help independents? Um, it's not, you know, I, not a this problem is going to, this is going to sound scared. really funny, yeah. but you know, as sort of, it'll sound <laughs> funny sort of, but maybe it'll make sense. You know, like all of that political stuff 
it's just, I don't, I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about it. And that may be to my detriment, you know, but really I'm interested in working on problems, you know. Um, you know, perhaps if it stings me more, not being as interested in campaign finance laws or, you know, how all of those things go about, um, you know, perhaps I'll become more interested. My husband, you know, is very defensive. You know, he gets very wound up about the slightest injustice, you know, and, you know, we should call and we should check. And, I, you know, I can't, I just don't have time. Right, right. Uh, as far as fixing problems go, do you see anything in any of the candidates running for governor, whether it's Sue Minter, Phil Scott, or even Bill Lee, that you think would work better for your values and your priorities in, in the state legislature? I'll tell you, I see that both candidates actually have varying, um, varying pieces that I think are potentially helpful um, for Vermonters. And both, I think, you know, have some issues. Um, I think it's a tough election. I don't think it's as, um, I don't think it's easy. I expect it to be a close election. And maybe I'll leave it at that unless you want to ask me some okay. specific. But I, I mean, I honestly do think that there are some, sure. you know, there are, there's good and bad about both. So I, I did want to get your reaction to a couple of things they're yeah. proposing and how you sure. thought that might work for the constituents in, in your Wyndham Bennington district uh, with Sue Minter. Uh, the Democratic candidate talking about uh, reassessing taxation based on the Blue Ribbon Commission panel suggestions in 2011, which would include a lot of service-based sales taxes. Now I think about the Mount Snow Valley, uh, the area that you service there, it seems like something that would affect a lot of businesses in, in that area. What, what are your thoughts about that? So I think in general, my thoughts are that we have some enormously transformative um, legislative efforts that are underway and have been underway in the state of Vermont that are in process right now. And with both candidates, you know, I certainly hope that the focus is going to be on, and, and those would be in particular healthcare and education, um, massive transformation going on in those systems. And we're a very small state. So it would be my expectation and hope that those would be really at the top of the agenda in terms of things that we want to make sure are functioning well, are funded well, um, and are producing really good outcomes. Uh, in, in, terms of, um, in terms of looking at the overall taxing structure, I think there's room for it. Yeah. Um, that's, that is a big undertaking. You know, that's something that I learned uh, when I was during my first biennium. Um, in our citizen legislature, um, it it's, takes a lot to you know get that many people to agree to move in a certain direction and negotiate. Um, and the bigger the issue, the more time it takes. And I think as a small state, we have a tremendous opportunity to be innovative and really lead the nation on a few things right. and do them incredibly well. And you know, I do worry about us getting a little ambitious. And I think you know, we've bitten off some pretty big pieces here with healthcare and education that are really important to Vermonters. So as I said, I think those really, I'm hoping, will be priority focus. You know, let's make sure that that um, transformation is going really well. But depending, so depending on what is in the budget and what what's being. Uh proposed there and the figures you're okay with funding it through sales tax on services is something that's on the table for you. I would take that on a case by case basis. Fair have enough. to have to look at it. Right. So uh, you, you talked a little bit about those programs and services and perhaps some of the things that we're biting off uh, that are a little bit too big for a state like Vermont when you look at what Phil Scott is proposing, uh, real fiscal responsibility, a phrase we keep hearing over and over again from the Republican governor or Lieutenant Governor, uh, wants to tie budget growth to economic growth, uh, keeps talking about cutting programs and services, hasn't gotten specific yet, he's been pressed on specifics, wondering if there are any programs in particular that are completely non-starters for you. I don't know. I don't know that there are, Chris, but you know, one of the things that I was um, involved in in the last year of the biennium was an initiative that had been um, underway for two years, government account, well, more than two years, but the Government Accountability Committee, and really asking our committees to start prioritizing um, the programs that were coming in. So for instance, I served on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee, and we have a number of different departments and agencies that come in and report um, to us on their programs, and asking our committees to really dig in and start prioritizing and looking at what is effective, um, what are we spending, uh, 
is this where we wanted to go? Does this tie into a greater overall plan? And you know, it's a little shocking that that was not the case of what was happening already. Um, so, and what is it that we're trying to achieve? Okay, small state, so this is doable. This is doable, and there's also a lot of legislators, right? Even though it's part-time and a citizen. So that um, initiative, I think, is really important. And um, I'm not actually for, you know, like, cut 2% off everything across the board. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not like, that program should go. You know, I mean, I think we have to look, it's, it's hard to cut programs. So I think this prioritizing of, you know, what is it that we want to do? What is the most important for Vermonters? Um, and, and what programs are working well needs to be done in order to manage our finances well. Yeah, and well, sensibly and responsibly. And you have an economic development background, and, and so are there areas in government up in Montpelier that you've seen that could use more efficiencies, maybe not a blanket 2% cut, but places that you've seen uh, within the administration or, or within different budgets for different programs that you're saying, yeah, if we needed to make a cut, this would be a place I think would be sensible. So really, in terms of finances, the places that I've really dug in and that I have, and, and I wouldn't even say you know that I have all of the knowledge that I need in order to be, in, you know, 100% certain. It's really commerce and um, and education. And no, it's not apparent to me that we should just lop that program off. I mean, for commerce, I'm not sure that we're spending, in fact, I'm sure we're not spending enough money, actually. Um, so, but I think that process should be mandated, encouraged, um, and it's hard to have people do that process in their committees because it takes time from doing other things that we really want to do. Right. But it's, it's really discipline that I think is needed in order for us to be able to be really successful in the things that we choose to do. And, and as I said, small state, there's a lot we can do, you know, but let's make sure we're, we're thoughtful. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the priorities that you've set out on your website, lorisabiliavt.com, for the upcoming session and your work on the Economic Development Committee. Uh, one of the things you call for is an assessment, development, and investment program for telecommunications for all Vermonters. Uh, certainly, when I think about the rural population and, and see your reaction to that, this is something that you think is a huge priority. What, what does that look like, uh, assessment, development, and investment? Uh, so way back from when you and I first met, when I was the Chamber of Commerce Director out in Wilmington, um, and we had a couple of bad winters out in the Wilmington Dover area, and you know, our towns got together and said, you know what, our economy is really, um, it's weather dependent, and we are kind of a one-trick pony. We have to diversify our economy. We've got to plan. We've got to think about how we can be less susceptible to these types of things. And we got together, we worked with um, Dr. John Mullen from UMass, we created a plan, we talked with our residents and our businesses, and the number one piece that came out of that plan, and that was in 2009, was um, that we had to expand our telecommunications and connect our residents and our businesses to both broadband and cell. It was the number one priority, or we were not going to make it. And I think as time you know, goes on, we see more and more people just are not willing to live where there is not connectivity. Um, I will never forget, so this was happening and we were really coming to this understanding, <clears throat> and I will never forget, uh, the stimulus funding came through for the state of Vermont and we had two major stimulus, telecommunication stimulus awards. I mean, literally I was jumping up and down in my office, you know, like check, check. Let's go to the next thing. Right. And, you know, they were massive. So I'm a reasonable person. So my expectation, you know, was they're going to take some time to implement. And, um, but I was thrilled. And waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, and as I'm sure you know, this, this session, you know, I had my um, residents from the town of Reedsboro actually call me down. As, long as, as well as Senator Campion, and say, uh, you need to come and tell us what's going to happen here because we have to have broadband and cell. We don't have it, and yeah, it's critical. Yeah. yeah. So we brought down the Department of Public Service, you know, to get some answers. I, I really had, you know, check, check. It's coming. It's coming. What percentage of your constituents at this point is it? Uh, do you yeah. have a sense of how many don't mm -hmm. have this? How many are on that last mile that hasn't uh, been serviced yet by broadband? I would say. <sighs> I mean, most of Reedsboro, mm -hmm. you know, Stanford has 
maybe about a third of Stanford. Stanford has put together some of their own um, systems. Wardsboro is pretty um, not so covered. Significant portion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you talk about the investment aspect of that, are you talking about funding from the state? I think that there has to be um, sustained funding for technology um, investment. This is not you know, different than the federal funds that you're talking about, these federal grants. You're talking about yes. funding yes. from the state. Okay. Yeah, and not just for the rural areas. I mean, technology is something that is changing always and always faster and faster. Um, we have, it's pitiful the amount of investment that we are making. You know, this year I think there was a little less than $700,000 that was available um, for the Department of Public Service to work with providers on extending to areas that weren't served. Never mind, you know, like let's increase or um, improve uh, areas that are served. Yeah. So, and, and, and that needs to be continual. That's not something that's gonna stop. So if we don't, don't have a means of um, raising funding and investing, uh, that's gonna be a problem. Yeah. You know, we're a rural state. We want to not be an overly developed state. Right, but something you don't see a, a private developer come in and, and put in place. No, well, you the, think it's more of the role of the state to do that than, than private enterprise. In this situation, a market economy solution is not going to work in our rural towns because private, private it just doesn't make money. It doesn't make sense for them. Yeah. How okay. about the regulation aspect of it? When you think about all the different things the state does and, and opposition on local communities, they mm -hmm. want better service, but they don't want a monopole, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how do you think uh, the state does with regulating this sort of technology? Well, I think that the modified telecommunications um, permitting has been helpful in that regard. Um, I think some of the abuses of that system that we've seen, um, you know, with poles being erected that aren't connecting anyone, um, you know, are not helpful in terms of maintaining that permitting, um, we'll see going forward. Um, and there's a lot of federal regulations also that are, that are you know, not anything we can do. Um, I certainly, this was not an issue actually for me until this past year. It wasn't something that I had done a big deep dive and, and thought about how are we gonna fix this. I certainly am now. Um, and I talked to legislative council, you know, during the last session, I kept talking to legislative council, seeing what we could do about these federal programs that were not working. And they kept telling me that what I wanted to do was not constitutional, which is great that we have lawyers <laughs> to tell they, us They can that. be helpful. They can be helpful, yeah, yes, indeed. but I'm still thinking. <laughs> Let's switch to another subject I know that you're passionate about, which is schools. Uh, yes. You still serve on, serve on the school board? I do, in your town? yes. Yeah, and, and I know uh, we've had some conversations about the district unification law, Act 46, uh, and some of the different fits and starts it's had uh, in different parts of the state. Uh, I don't think anyone thinks it's a perfect law. I think uh, a lot of people think maybe it needs to be tweaked, and then there's a lot of people that think it needs a complete overhaul. Mm -hmm. uh, it is working in other parts of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, from your point of view, uh, is it something that needs just that little extra tweak, or is it something that you think needs to go back to the drawing board on, so to speak. So I think it's important to, um, first of all, establish uh, what Act 46 does, which is, or what Act 46 is likely to do, which is to create more equitable education opportunities. It's not likely to help us get a handle on property taxes. So in terms of addressing property taxes and being able to manage those, um, we have not, we've not done that with Act 46. So that still needs to be done. Right. Um, so with Act 46 and looking at educational opportunities, um, what's happened, what I see happening, so I'm also on the Vermont School Boards Association board. I'm also serving on an Act 46 study committee. Um, <clears throat> what's happened uh, in places that it was easier to do this work, um, more obvious, um, it's, it's being done and being done pretty quickly and those folks are realizing some pretty significant tax savings. Um, interestingly enough, that is mostly in the Burlington, Montpelier kind of triangle, flat or mm -hmm. triangle. Um, Southern Vermont, um, I, don't, I don't believe 
I s that we have passed any, approved any articles yet, the voters still. Um, and in the Northeast Kingdom, they've had a um, mixed bag of success. Some have been passed, some have not. Um, I think that one size fits all is not going to work. I think there will need to be some tweaks. Um, I think one of my big complaints about this, um, about Act 46, big concerns about Act 46 and going into the next session, um, one of the things I'll be focusing on is there's no what I call geographic intelligence really over looking over this. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, we have students throughout the whole state um, and over and separated by some very large mountains um, and some pretty big distances. And um, I'm okay with high schoolers driving you know, for an hour, I'm not necessarily okay with kindergartners or first graders doing that. Um, nor do I necessarily think the trade-off in opportunity really matches that. Um, I think people in general are doing the best that they can. And so, you know, I'm concerned. Um, I think we're, some of our towns are gonna need more help. They're gonna need more time. Um, and I, I, I believe pretty strongly that the state um, agency of education, um, the board of education should not be coming in and making recommendations um, about who's going where and how things are gonna be split up in regions and in districts where people are working. I think they should be coming in and helping more. And, that, and, and that's gonna be challenging because the agency of education, um, in my opinion, is understaffed um, and we've just had massive federal le re legislation passed um, to replace no child left behind every child succeeds every student succeeds something like that right and so now they're trying to implement that right let me ask you about the property tax aspect of okay. it as you say and I think yes. rightfully uh, Act 46 doesn't really make mm -hmm. that a priority uh, is a priority to change the way schools are funded period uh, there's thoughts out there that it should be funded through an income tax or just a different way that it, it's allocated. When you talk about needing property tax reform, mm -hmm. uh, you're talking specifically about school funding, mm -hmm. uh, but what is it exactly that needs reforming? Is it the amount, is it the allocated, or is it the source? Um, I think, what so what needs reforming in terms of the property tax? Yeah, yeah. I think there are not, so right now we have a state education property tax, and then we have 250 or, you know, or plus um, levers that come off of that, okay? So there's no entity that's able to really be accountable for what's going on with that property tax. It's the tragedy of the commons. Um, and this is actually why our, we're not able to get our situation under control um, in terms of property tax. I shouldn't say under control. It could be that what we're spending is fine, but we don't have a means of um, cutting spending or adding spending in a way that allows us to change outcomes for all kids across the state. So <clears throat> do I think going to an income-based an income -based, um, tax instead would change things? Uh, I, I don't think, we, we're pretty income sensitized right now. The property tax is income sensitized. It's, you know, residents are highly income sensitized. You know, in most of my towns, um, it's businesses and second homeowners that are paying a lot of this um, and wealthy and wealthy folks because we are already income sensitized. So, <clears throat> I don't know that that's a huge priority, you know, a huge pro that that's actually the problem, that people are not paying according to their ability. I think that's actually how we've got it set up, mm -hmm. um, that people are paying according to their ability. <clears throat> so. Okay. Uh, similar question with regards to costs of, okay. of living in the state. And uh, I know with time we tape this, uh, you're just coming from the public forum here in the town of Brattleboro about this new healthcare model called mm -hmm. all payer. Yeah. Uh, certainly the state struggling uh, and you've been had a front row seat for this as it tries to figure out how to deliver healthcare in a rural state, much like education challenges uh, with the rural communities that we have here. Uh, what you're hearing about this all payer model uh, is something, uh, what, what are your feelings about it? So <clears throat> healthcare um, in general, uh, I'm a little concerned that we have bitten off more than we can chew by ourselves. So um, with what we've done um, through with federal programs as well is really increase the number of people that have health insurance, which is great. We haven't necessarily increased the amount of money there is to pay for those people. 
um, and now we're looking at um, we're looking at uh, changing how physicians and hospitals are paid, um, which I'm not necessarily opposed to that either. Um, I'm a little concerned about us continuing to work by ourselves. I don't know that that's to Vermonter's advantage. I don't know that that's to um, that that's as cost effective or may, or even as quality effective. You know, when we're looking at we, Massachusetts has got a great program. You know, we could. Uh, what about the federal exchange? Both uh, gubernatorial candidates have said that that's an option that's on the table. Sure. You know, I mean, I I appreciate and admire that. You know, we we're trying to do some innovative things here, but also, do we have the scale to do this on our own and do it well? That's. That's my question, and I don't have an answer for that, but that continues to be my question, you know. And, uh, Even after meeting with Governor Shumlin and, and Al Golbeal, the yeah, board well, chair for Green Mountain Cares today, I mean, you just, had, you just heard the questions from the public here, and you still have the same questions coming out as you had going in. Yeah, I mean, I asked, I, I asked one question, uh, which was, you know, do we have a sense of how this may change delivery of care in the rural areas of Vermont? And the answer is, not really. You know, we're going to have to work through this. We're going to have to have the will and the courage to work together to make sure that it does. Okay? And so, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. That's, you know, that's a, a risk-taking, um, <laughs> a willingness to experiment. Um, and that is how things get better and how things change. Um, I don't know that Vermonters Healthcare is the place that I want to see us doing that so much, but that's where we're at. Right. I want to, before we run out of time, give you a chance to talk about what I think is probably uh, the accomplishment that is the signature of your first couple of years in there, and that's establishing the Southern Vermont Economic Development Zone, mm -hmm. uh, having a committee set up to, to explore how the southern part of the state can be more economically vital and working together, getting some money uh, for that initiative to happen. Um, what, what else can you do in the next session? I mean, not, not looking five years, 10 years down the road, but what's the goals uh, for the next two years with that if you're reelected? So I think um, I certainly would like to see a dovetailing of the whole connectivity and the zone um, initiative. And really the zone is, um, I think, replicable and uh, throughout the state. It's really a means of collaboration. How can we have folks, we're small, throughout all of Vermont, we're rural. How can we have folks work together better to do bigger things, right? Because we're mm -hmm. so tiny. So that's really what the zone's about. Can we have better strategies, more effective strategies if we work together? So I would love to see, and I shout out to Representative Oliver Olson from Londonderry, Representative Kaya Morris from Bennington, um, and also Senator Ballant, who've really been advocating and pushing for this. Um, as well as Representative Bill Bozzo, the chair of my committee, also a resident of Pano. So connectivity is the number one most important thing, I think, um, with education. One and two. We'll, right. we'll let them one talk. And one we'll a. let Yes, yeah. one, one A and one B <laughs> um, for rural economic development. You yeah. know, critical. So. Yeah. Well, and those are issues easily found on your website, laurasibiliavt.com. Uh, we're just about out of time. Is there anything you wanted to say to the viewers before we go? Just, I, you know, I know that the uh, national elections are a little discouraging for folks. Um, I think maybe that's an understatement. They're a lot discouraging, the tone and tenor. Uh, it's really important this year. We are getting a new governor, and uh, whether or not you vote actually will matter. Um, I'm in a contested race. Whether or not folks vote uh, will matter to both me and my opponent. Uh, so I think important, uh, take a deep breath and go to the polls. Don't look away. Um, and thank you. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Great to see you. Okay. And thank you at home for watching this edition of Meet the Candidates on Brattleboro Community Television. I want to remind everybody that early voting is available. Uh, at all the different communities. So go to your town clerk's office and election day is of course November 8th. Visit BrattleboroTV.org to watch this episode on demand as well as other editions of Meet the Candidates. Thank you.